This is the closing keynote for me, because unfortunately I can't be here on Sunday, and for some of the rest of you it may be the closing keynote. So I just want to say what an amazing experience this conference has been. I really feel like uh, I've kind of met a tribe here, uh, and, and it's, it's just been incredible. So I just want to get Tiana and Ariba and Robert and Martina and Will to stand up, and for everyone to give them a massive round of applause for this amazing conference. And with that, how to <coughs> mess up respect for people and really piss off your employees. So John Shook, who is a living legend, um, started this conference. And I'm going to kind of refer to him and a bunch of other people. Uh, and it's been really interesting to me watching all these different pieces fall into place that are very deeply connected to each other and reinforce each other in interesting ways. Uh, and there have been little nuggets that have fed into what I'm going to talk about all, all through this conference. Um, so. Uh, Selena talking about lean work experience, the idea that UX is for employees, not just for customers, but part of your user experience is the experience that your employees have when they're working at your company. Uh, and fundamentally, all your users eventually are going to be communicating with your employees, uh, at least if you want to develop the empathy that you need in order to be able to serve them effectively. So lean UX isn't just about your company in the external world, it's about the stuff that goes on within your company as well. And that's always been a key plank of lean. Respect for people is part of the lean house, uh, and it's, it's something that John Shook talk about um, in, in his talk. Um, I, I just want to say, I stole this title from Sasha Bates, who gave a talk with this title. Uh, Sasha Bates is awesome. If you want to know about DevOps, she's great. Um, but what, what struck me in John Shook's talk was, was this sentence that he, he, he said. You know, if, if work is simply a transaction of time and money, we can't ask for people's hearts and minds. And this is the difference between kind of, I mean, people think there's a difference between algorithmic work where you just follow the recipe and it's done versus heuristic work, which is knowledge work, which is what we're engaged in. And it's not as simple as that. What lean manufacturing showed is that even in, you know, I, what are theoretically algorithmic tasks, you just can't behave like that. Um, you know, people have to be involved and have to make decisions and have to have uh, input and their creativity harnessed at every level of the organization. Um, and what killed this, is, as somebody said earlier, is this idea from uh, a paper by Jensen and Meckling called Theory of the Firm that shareholder value is about, you know, shareholder value should govern how we run companies. Um, Jack Welch is kind of an interesting guy. He's a salty fellow, uh, the guy who was um, CEO of GE. This is his comment about, about that idea, which I love. You know, shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world. It's a result, not a strategy. Your main constituencies are your employees, your customers, and your products. And the fact that he put employees first, I think, you know, takes us back to that whole kind of founding principle of lean, that what provides value to your company is, is not the products you build, or even the IP that you create, but your employees. Uh, and, and the competitive advantage is the fact that your employees are continuously able to create new things. Um, uh, and that's why Tesla outsourced its, uh, sorry, open sourced its IP. It's the same thing. There's an early story from Toyota where someone stole um, the blueprints for one of the Toyota's early machines. And um, I think it was uh, I think it was Sakichi Toyota. I can't remember. Said, uh, you know, we don't care. Um, by the time they've built, they've copied our stuff. We're going to have built something new, um, and they won't have learned the lessons that we learned from failing first. Um, so really, your, your your people are your true value as a company, and what allows you to create a company where people can be creative is culture. One of my favourite cultural commenters on Silicon Valley culture is Shanley Kane. Uh, and this is one of my favorite quotes of hers. Our true culture is made primarily of the things no one will say. Culture is about power dynamics, unspoken priorities and beliefs, mythologies, conflicts, enforcement of social norms, creation of in-out groups, and distribution of wealth and control inside companies. And if you ever wonder, you know, if you go into an engineering room and look around and see there's a bunch of white dudes there, um, you know, maybe you can reflect on, on this. Uh, to, to see why that's the case, because there's certainly no uh, genetic reason why that should be so. Um, I am fascinated by this, uh, by culture, and by uh, 
engineering and building products. And one of the things I wanted to do is, is get some data on it um, and what works and what doesn't. And so I teamed up with Nicole Forsgren and Gene Kim and uh, Puppet Labs. <laughs> uh, and we produced the State of DevOps report last year based on surveying 9,000, over 9,000 people worldwide across a number of different domains. And what we found were three super interesting things. Number one, you know, people have been telling us for years that IT doesn't matter. Nicholas Carr, IT doesn't matter. IT is not a competitive advantage. And we know that's not true, actually. Uh, the data shows very clearly that firms with high-performing IT were twice as likely to exceed their, you know, the three organizational goals we, we care about, profitability, market share, and productivity goals. So when we looked at the, the, the people who responded who had exceeded their profitability, market share, and productivity goals, uh, the people who had high-performing IT were twice as likely to have achieved that. Um, we wanted to look at what predicts organizational performance, and, and these are the measures of organizational performance that, that we looked at, which are standardized metrics, profitability, market share, productivity. And what we found was this. The top predictor of organizational performance was job satisfaction, measured according to uh, these top four questions. Uh, net promoter score for whether the organization is a good place to work, whether you're satisfied with your job, whether it makes good use of your skills and abilities, and whether you have the tools and resources to do your job well. And then the fifth pr thing that predicted org performance was actually using data uh, from production in order to create a feedback loop to make business decisions, which is what Jeff Sussner was talking about. The top predictor of job satisfaction, in turn, was organizational culture. How do you measure culture? I mean, one of the things that Shanley's quote tells us is that culture is um, intangible. But just because it's intangible doesn't mean you can't measure it. Uh, and you can certainly perceive it uh, if, if you look around. We used a model from a sociologist called Ron Westrom in order to measure organizational culture. Now, Westrom is a guy who's been studying safety outcomes in healthcare and aviation. So these are industries where when things go wrong, people die. Safety is very, very important. And so he divided organizations up using this typology, um, three different kinds of organization based on these six different axes, how we treat cooperation between different departments, uh, how messengers between departments, uh, both you know, across organization, the organization, up and down, um, how those are treated, how we deal with responsibilities, how we deal with bridging, and then finally, perhaps for me the two most interesting things, how we deal with failure and how we deal with novelty. Now, Every enterprise, fundamentally, is a complex adaptive system. And as Dave Snowden pointed out, in a complex adaptive system, you can't predict the future. There's two things that we know about all complex adaptive systems. One, you can't predict the effects of any particular action that, you, uh, that happens in the system. And secondly, nobody ever has perfect information, especially not the leadership team. Uh, everyone is operating in conditions of uncertainty. And so, how do we deal with accidents, with things going wrong? When things go wrong, often what we do is we try and find the person responsible and you know, definitely tell them off uh, and maybe fire them. Uh, and what you've got to do whenever that happens is ask yourself this simple question. If that had been me in that position, could I, with, with, the, with the information and the tools available to me, could I have made the same mistake? And if we're honest, most of the time the answer is yes, that could have been me and I could have made the same mistake. So how should we deal with failure? Any investigation that ends in human factors is, is not telling us something useful because it's not telling us how to fix the problem. Investigations should start with the human factors and work back to the systemic factors that provided insufficient information to those people or didn't give them the tools to effectively understand what the, what the effects of their actions would be. That's what we need to do. And then the most fascinating bit of this, really, for me, was that a model that predicted safety outcomes also predicted our ability to innovate. So novelty, how do we deal with novelty? Is it implemented? Does it lead to problems? Or my favorite, is it crushed? So the same model that predicts safety outcomes also predicts novelty. How do we measure this? Very simple, we had a Likert scale, uh, and we, we found out whether people agreed or disagreed with these statements. And, you know, I'm sure many of you, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but I'm sure many of you will recognize where you fall on this spectrum. It's a pretty visceral model. Um, but the question is, if you're over here, how do you get over to here? One of the most interesting case studies, which is the one that I start my book with, um, it 
is actually from Toyota. So who's heard of NUMI, New United Motor Manufacturing? Okay, a handful of you, that's cool. So I'm going to briefly talk about this story. Um, NUMI, well, I live in California. I live uh, near Berkeley, and about 30 minutes down the road from me is Fremont. Uh, and in Fremont, in the early 80s, was a plant called Fremont Assembly, which was General Motors, uh, a General Motors plant in Fremont. It was the only car manufacturing plant in the whole of California, and it had it made the worst quality cars of any GM plant, and the worker uh, management relations were, were terrible, to the extent that people would do things like um, putting Coke bottles in the car doors so that the car doors would rattle when you opened and shut them. People were taking drugs on the job, they were gambling, they were smoking, because they just didn't give a shit. And so GM shut this plant down. And then um, GM, at the same time, it turned out, was also talking to Toyota. Toyota wanted to open a manufacturing plant in, um, in uh, the USA because the US had trade barriers that prevented Toyota from exporting cars to the US uh, and undercutting U uh, US manufacturers. Uh, and GM wanted to understand how to build small cars profitably, which Toyota could do. So they had a joint partnership, and they decided to use the Fremont Assembly Plant to be the site of that joint partnership. Uh, and then something really fascinating and crazy happened, which was that the Toyota management, uh, sorry, the union workers from Fremont Assembly, the union workers' leadership, convinced Toyota management to rehire the same people. And they sent these people who had had a miserable time at Fremont Assembly, uh, where relations had completely broken down. They sent them to Toyota City in Nagoya in Japan to learn the Toyota production system. And John Shook was actually the first US employee of Toyota in Japan. Uh, and he helped create the training material for those American workers who were sent to Nagoya. Uh, and they learned the Toyota production system. They came back and started up uh, the NUMI plant in California. And within a few weeks, they were producing cars which were as high quality as any cars produced anywhere in America by, G by GM, and as good quality as the cars that Toyota was producing in Japan. Same people. And what that tells you is that it's not the people that are the problem. It's the system that's the problem and the management that are the problem, not the people. And whenever you're working in a crappy organization and people are like, well, we should hire better people and let's get in the great people, that, I mean, that, that doesn't work. What happens is the system crushes the people. Uh, Deming said, a bad system will beat a good person every time. But what the NIMI example says is that you can turn that around. You can fix the system. Uh, so if you want to find out more about this, there's a great episode of This American Life um, where it talks about uh, the NUMI case study. Uh, there's an article by John Shook in Sloan Review called How to Change a Culture Lessons from NUMI, which I highly recommend everyone read. Really fascinating. Um, but I just want to talk about one thing in particular. Um, in, here's a picture of um, the production line in, this is actually a Toyota plant in the UK. And you can see um, along the bottom there's these markings, and if you saw John Shook's talk a couple of days ago, you could see he, he had a slide with the markings on the floor. So what happens is, if you're at a GM plant, what happens is uh, you know, the car goes along and you're trying to fit the door on whatever it is you're supposed to do. Uh, and if you get to the end and you haven't done it, the car goes on and you're like, ah, shit. And then uh, the car gets to the end of the production line. You've got a bunch of quality control people who look at it and they're like, that's never going to run. And they move it into a car park where it basically goes to be fixed later or rust, whichever happens first. And in a Toyota plant, something different happens. You, you kind of start and, 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 and on your job, and the car goes along the production line, and you get to a certain point, and if you haven't got your job done by that point, you can pull the and on cord, and, and then what happens is a manager comes along, and the manager helps you. <laughs> How about that? So like that's difference number one. Uh, and then if you get to the end of your spot, and you haven't managed to get your job done, you can pull the and on cord again, the production line stops, uh, and you fix the problem, and then you reflect later on how, how, to make it, how to make it better, how to improve the system, so you don't end up in that situation before. So, who knows what Toyota was making before they were making cars? Anyone? Looms, that's right. Uh, this was Toyota's breakthrough products, uh, which was nearly 100 years ago now, um, the Toyota Automatic Loom Type G. And the big innovation in this 
device. Uh, before this device was created, uh, and actually something in the UK was created around the same time uh, that may have been an inspiration for this, you had a bunch of people sitting in a room looking at the looms, uh, and they were, they were mechanical, they were automatic, but if something went wrong, the loom would stop, and then the human would intervene and fix the problem. But they were basically just staring at the looms, waiting for them to go wrong, just like this. And they went wrong, and then you fixed it. So what was different about the Toyota Automatic Loom Type G is this. When it, it could automatically defect to detect a defect. When something goes wrong, the loom can automatically sense that something's gone wrong, and it stops working, and make, you know, lights up a light to say, um, you know, please help. And someone comes along and fixes it. And that completely changed the economics of this process. Instead of having one person just sitting staring at the loom, instead of that, you can have one person watching a whole room, and the machines will tell you when something's wrong, and then you can come in and fix it. And that combines the best part of machines, which is the ability to detect what something's wrong, which is an algorithmic task, and the best part of being a human, which is the ability to do problem solving, to apply heuristics. And that creates a tremendous improvement in productivity. So we have a process that's exactly analogous to this in building software. Does anyone know what it is? Continuous integration. That's exactly right. That's exactly what continuous integration is. We have something that whenever you make a change to the system, it builds the system, runs the tests, and if it finds a problem, it lights up a red light, and then, hopefully, you fix it. Uh, often people don't, that's bad. It's like, you know, the loom says, ah, I've got a problem, and you're like, nah, fuck it. Beep, and make all this kind of crappy fabric that no one can use. Uh, so that's the analogy for what happens in CI when the build goes red and everyone's like, sod it, uh, I'm just gonna keep committing codes, that's fine. Um, the other interesting thing about the Numi case is that people tried to copy what had gone well at Numi. So, uh, you know, GM ideally wanted all their plants to be like Nui, um, but they were totally unable to reproduce it. What happened was, you know, managers from other plants would come and take pictures of the entire production line and then try and copy it in other Numi plants, uh, sorry, in other GM plants, but it wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to achieve the same results. What would happen is, you know, people would have the Andon cord, but no one would pull the Andon cord because uh, the managers were rewarded by how many cars came off the production line, whatever quality those cars were. So this is something we see in product all the time, is, you know, you have all the lean stuff in place, but it doesn't produce the same effect. Um, and this, this concerns a lot of the lean people. So there's a guy called Mike Rother, who uh, created the book Learning to See, which talks about value stream mapping, who's been studying Toyota and lean organizations for a number of different years. Uh, and you know, he's actually employed by companies to, to tell them what Toyota does so they can copy it and be like Toyota. And he would, he would kind of say, well, you know, we looked at these Toyota factories and they're doing these things and they would copy them, but they wouldn't get the same results. Uh, and, and, and then Mike Rother would go back to the factory and, and see that they weren't doing those things anymore. And he would be like, oh, well, that's embarrassing. You know, I just told these people to go and do that. And you know, now, now Toyota's not doing it anymore. Um, and you know, he, he worked out pretty quickly that um, as, as John Shook and um, Dave Snowden said, what was critical was the ability of the people to come up with countermeasures to the particular problems they were facing at that time. The actual countermeasures weren't important. What was important was the ability to develop new countermeasures by looking at the system and, and, and working out, uh, experimenting with ideas to try and make things better. And that was really critical about, uh, and what's different about Toyota, that everyone, not just managers, but everyone has the ability to do that. Uh, and so he ended up studying what managers do at Toyota and how you learn to be a manager at Toyota. And he wrote this book, which I, I, is one of my favorite books of the last few years, called Toyota Kata, which talks about how managers learn to be managers at Toyota, which is basically by working on the shop floor and, being, and participating in that experience of experimenting with process improvement. Uh, and what he says, basically, I mean, it's very simple and it's very lightweight. Uh, and, and, you know, Hoshin Kunri strategy deployment is based on, you know, taking this and applying it in a fractal way through the whole organization with different time horizons. Um, but what this is about is, where do we want to go? What's our challenge? How will we, how, what's true north? Where are we right now? And you can do a value stream map to look at the current condition. Where do we want to be in you know, a month or so's time? 
what's the measurable future state we want to achieve in about a month's time? And then you don't plan how you're going to get there because you don't know how you're going to get there. What you do instead is you enable the people doing the work to run a bunch of experiments using plan, do, check, act, the Deming cycle, in order to try and find out how they're going to achieve the target condition. And then you just repeat that um, once a month or once every two to six weeks. And the job of management is basically to run this process and to facilitate the people doing the work to experiment. Um, and experimentation looks like this. Every day, people come into work and you ask yourself, what's the target condition we're trying to achieve? What's the actual condition right now? What obstacles are preventing us from achieving the target condition? And which one are we going to address right now? And what experiment are we going to run to try and achieve that target condition? And then the other thing is, how fast can we see if we can learn? How fast can we learn from trying that experiment and gathering the data and analyzing it? And this is you know, analogous to the build, measure, learn loop. You know, the, the critical metric is, how fast can we learn? How fast can we go through this cycle? So there's a great case study that I really love talking about by um, HP LaserJet Firmware, uh, this book here. Practical Approach to Large-Scale Agile Development. Uh, and this is a guy, Gary Groover, who independently invented both continuous delivery and the improvement cutter, which is a kind of crazy thing to do. And I'm like, Gary, you're amazing. And he's from Iowa, and I'm kind of learning about America. Uh, so I, he's from Iowa, and he was basically like, it's just common sense. And I'm like, what do you mean, Gary? It's not common sense. It's amazing. He's like, Rrr. and so he's very kind of brief and doesn't say a lot and, and likes potatoes, and apparently that somehow Iowan. Um, anyway, this is a really good book, and it basically describes, it doesn't use the language of the improvement cutter, but he's totally doing the improvement cutter, because what he did is uh, they basically took the firmware team on HP LaserJet from being the critical path on every release to being uh, actually able to not be the critical path on every release, and also to improve the amount of money they were spending on innovation by a factor of 10. So there was a 10x increase in productivity over the three years that they re-architected their system and did process improvement. Um, and the way he did it is, you know, they had a clear direction. So if you're looking at the direction here, they set a clear goal, which was a 10x productivity increase. The amount of money we're spending on productivity, or on on building features rather than non-value ad work like uh, testing or kind of running builds or integration, all this kind of stuff that they were spending all their time on. Uh, we want to increase that by a factor of 10. Very clear, simple goal that everyone can see and is measurable. And every month, he and his team, and it was about uh, 400 people split across three different countries, so quite a large distributed team, would agree on the goals they were going to achieve that month. And so this is a list, this is about two and a half years in, this is a list of the goals that they wanted to achieve um, for mini milestone 30, which is month 30. And what you can see here is, you know, here's the actual kind of measurable goals they wanted to achieve that month. Um, and again, you, you know when you're done with these, it's not improve the rate at which we fix bugs, it's priority, issue, priority one issues open less than a week, level two test failures fixed within 24 hours, so you know when you're done with these. And the other cool thing about this is they all fit on one page. So the entire team of 400 people, three countries, they're in all their goals for all those people across the entire month are written on one page. And everyone prints that off and, 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 and nobody gets to say they're done or they've achieved their goal unless everyone's done. That's the other key piece of this. And this is the problem with the kind of typical scaled agile thing of taking the epics and breaking them down into features and then into stories and then handing all the stories to the teams. And then you come back in a month and you try and make it actually work. And then the whole thing falls apart because it's a piece of shit. And everyone's like, well, I did my bit. And they're all right. They all did do their bit. But in terms of the outcomes, what we achieved is, you know, actually pretty nasty. Uh, and that's the problem with this approach. Instead of specifying all the little bits that we think when you integrate them together will actually achieve the outcome, let's specify the outcome and enable the people to run experiments to try and achieve that outcome through working together and using their creativity and passion. The cool thing about the improvement cutter is that you can also use it for developing software-based products. Software-based products have a unique characteristic that manufacturing products don't have, which is the marginal cost of changing them can approach zero. 
I mean, that's the whole point of continuous delivery, to make it so the marginal cost of changing your products approaches zero. Unlike manufacturing, where if you change the design, you have to change all the production lines and all this kind of thing. In software, you should be able to make a change and then send it out into production at almost zero cost if you're doing it right. And that, the economics of software-based products, uh, allows you to use this improvement cattle methodology for doing product evolution. So, as well as setting process targets, you can set targets around, you know, we want customer conversion to increase by 15%. Uh, we want, uh, I don't know, you can, you can set all kinds of customer-facing or organization-wide outcomes uh, for what you want the product improvements over the month to achieve. And then you can work backwards from that uh, to the actual features that you're going to build. So one of my other favorite books from the last few years is by Goiko Adzik. It's a book called Impact Mapping. Who's come across Impact Mapping? Okay, it's super cool. So it's very, very simple. All these things I'm talking about are very, very simple and lightweight. Here's the goal we want to achieve, which is a measurable customer or user goal. And then you look at the personas who can either, or the, the people who can help or hinder achieving that goal. You look at how they can help achieving that goal or prevent you from achieving it. And then you look at the what. Here's the things that they can do in order to, to achieve or, or prevent you from achieving that goal. And what happens in a traditional waterfall or even kind of the agile kind of water scrum fall thing that we see in real life where you have analysts and then uh, developers and then operations people is the analysts basically take this entire space uh, and they just give you a single path through it. So in their minds, the analysts are taking all this information, they're choosing one single path through it, and then this is what hand gets handed to the developers. And the developers build that one thing, and then they ship it. And then if you're really lucky, you might find out if it actually achieved the outcome you wanted to achieve. Often it doesn't. And then we're like, but we shipped the feature. And then we're like, but we didn't achieve the outcome. And they're like, oh, well, what's, uh, what are we going to do? In, what's next in the backlog? Right? So. This is terrible. This is like taking a really beautiful music recording and putting it through the most lossy MP3 encoder you possibly can, and then listening to the, you know, the developers are listening to <laughs> the other end and trying to build that as fast as possible, and then what you get at the end is a load of crap. So instead of doing that, what we should do is actually all of us should look at, focus on the outcomes we're trying to achieve and, and make sure that everyone in the organization knows what the outcomes are, and then everyone should know should collaborate in creating the impact map, and then you should run experiments to decide which of these things are actually going to give the expected outcome. And, and this maps very nicely to, Jean, to Jeff Gothel's template here. You know, we believe that building this feature, this feature, for these people, these people, will achieve this outcome, this outcome. We'll know we're successful when we see this signal from the market. What's the experiment we're going to run? And you know, there's tons of ways of experimenting. Obviously, you're all UX people. You know about all this stuff. Uh, A/B testing is generally considered the gold standard because it's the only way you can actually cor uh, get cause and effect rather than just correlation. Um, and A/B testing uh, is really fascinating and really depressing. Um, I spoke to Ronnie Kahavi, who built the A-B testing framework for Amazon and then went on to build uh, Microsoft's A-B testing framework. He has tons of data for A-B tests, and, and what he found is this. Evaluating well-designed and executed experiments that were designed to improve a key metric, only about one-third were successful at improving that key metric. That means that two-thirds of the work that we do delivers zero or negative value unless we're actually measuring the impact and stopping work on the things that don't deliver value. And there's you know, not only the opportunity cost of not building the right thing, there's also the cost of maintaining it forever and the complexity that it adds to our systems that prevents us from in, uh, adding more features in future. So it, this is the biggest source of waste. We could be spending three or four of our working days on the beach and deliver the same value to our customers if only we knew the two-thirds of the features we're building that are delivering zero or negative value. And that's why Amazon invested an insane amount of money and four years of their entire engineering team re-architecting their entire platform to enable them to do continuous deployment. Uh, you know, and, and the, I love this because it just makes people's head explode, including mine. You know, 1,079 deployments in an hour, deployments every 11.6 seconds. One of the reasons they did this is so they could experiment and avoid building stuff that didn't matter. There's a great story, which I'm going to finish with, from early on in, in Amazon. Uh, so 
there's a blog post by a guy called Greg Linden from 2006 talking about something that he'd done a few years earlier at Amazon. So Greg Linden worked on the checkout team at Amazon, and uh, he had an idea. So when you go to a candy store, uh, at the candy store, there's a checkout aisle, and there's kind of candy and all kinds of other things, and you're like, I'm not going to eat the candy. Who's got kids? <laughs> so you know what happens, right? And your kids are like, candy, candy. You're like, no, I'm going to be good. And you're like, oh, fuck it, I'll buy the candy. And then everyone's sad, uh, except your kid who's happy for about five minutes and then has like a sugar crash, and then it's awful again. Um, and so... Amazon wanted to do something analogous for, for Amazon.com, or Greg, rather, wanted to do something analogous for Amazon.com, which is to give you recommendations based on what was actually in your shopping cart. Um, so other people have bought things like this, and they bought these other things, so I'm going to recommend you those other things. And Greg built a prototype to give you recommendations at checkout and took it to a VP of engineering, uh, sorry, a VP of product, and the VP of product said, nice idea, Greg, you absolutely can't build this. Uh, it's going to distract people from checkout, uh, so please don't work on it anymore. And Greg, you know, went back to his desk, a little bit sad, um, got his prototype, pushed it into production, ran an A-B test, gathered the data that showed that actually this was going to produce a you know, several percent increase in revenue, which is a big deal for Amazon. Went back to the VP with those numbers and said, you know, this is actually a really good idea. And the VP probably wasn't thrilled um, but said, well, you better get on with this and, and build it uh, super quick. So who here works at a company where it's even conceivable that against the express wishes of a VP, you could just push an experiment into production uh, on your own without even asking anyone? Okay, a few of you. So it's a great blog post. I really recommend reading it, and this is my favorite quote from it. I think building this culture is the key to innovation. Creativity must flow from everywhere. Whether you're a summer intern or the CTO, any good idea must be able to seek an objective test, preferably a test that exposes the idea to real customers. Everyone must be able to experiment, learn, and iterate. And that's how to uh, not piss off your employees uh, and create uh, a great people-centered culture. Thank you very much.